baptized in late 1892 uh, and baptized in January of 1893 here at All Saints. Um, his family lived in Mint Cottages um, in Mint, Mint Road and Park Road, just up by the Mint Public House. Um, his father's family, the Farleys, uh, had come to Banstead from Guildford. Uh, they were a labouring family. They'd originally lived at Burheath before they moved to Banstead. And William's father grew up at Devonshire Cottages, um, which used to stand on the corner of Garrett's Lane and Shrubland Road many years ago. Um, he married uh, a Kent girl, Emily Parsons. Um, I'm always intrigued by these people. I have no idea how they meet. It was a time of labour on the move, and there were loads of people coming into Banstead and loads of Banstead people going out to work elsewhere. And so there's, very often we're finding our Surrey men meeting Kent girls or vice versa uh, and getting married and, and settling in Banstead. And it really intrigues me as to what their stories are, but we sadly won't know for many of them. But they made their home at Mint Cottages. Now, um, Mint had started off being grown in the Physic Gardens in Mitcham um, in the 18th century and earlier. Um, but in the Victorian time, um, everything that was grown in Mitcham, mint, lavender and chamomile, started expanding um, out this way. Lavender never made it really to Banstead, just as far as the Woodman Stern, Carshalton border uh, and just the other side of Belmont. Uh, but mint did, and it was very successfully grown here. Uh, mint Farm um, it has the name still, Mint Cottages, Mint Road, uh, the Mint Public House, it's also grown on small holdings uh, down by the Drift Bridge and um, along Sutton Lane um, as well. All kinds of varieties, black mint, white mint, peppermint, spearmint, all sorts of different things. Um, the uh, aromatic oils from these, uh, these plants when harvested have to be processed at, um, at a mill. So most, um, most of the time they were transported down to the, the River Wandle uh, for processing there. And these factories processing plants belching out great big um, plow clouds of very sharp smelling uh, black smoke and all the, distilling all these, uh, all these oils for sale in, in small um, bottles. And mint industry um, remained in Banstead for, for quite some time and is still being grown here um, into the 20th century. So mint cottages were probably originally built to house people that were working at um, Mint Farm. They're a very confusing place. If you look at the census returns, uh, all of the occupants have moved around. So very often they're still in mint cottages, they're just living in a different house. Uh, and this is what happened to the Farleys. So um, William's father was presumably working as a farm labourer for either Mint Farm or Place Farm just over the road. And they're originally living at number two, which is one of the four weatherboard cottages that are on Park Road, just by the side of the mint. Now, um, we have just a couple of weeks ago uh, come into possession of a 19th century watercolour which is probably the earliest picture we've ever seen of the mint. It doesn't have a sign outside saying the mint, but it looks very much like it. And next to it, where those four weatherboard cottages are now, is a very ramshackle old barn that looks like it's just about to collapse. And it probably did very soon afterwards, and, the, and mint cottages were built probably sometime in the middle of the 19th century. So they lived there, and then they moved around the corner to what was then number 13, but is now number nine. There were two rows of uh, brick and flint um, cottages down there, again quite old. Um, they were infilled, so they then became a continuous row of 10 um, cottages. Then after they lived there, they moved further down the road, further towards Mint Farm, where there were three cottages, um, all sort of cobbled together uh, by Mint Farm. So that's uh, the modern number 11 um, is where they were living. So William grew up, uh, probably came, went to school in Banstead. Uh, he became a gardener at one of the local big houses. This was uh, an entry level job for our boys leaving school. They would go and work at one of the, uh, one of the big houses um, around here. He was probably working at Banstead Place, I should imagine, being just over the road um, from him. And they very often do this for a few years, start as a gardener's boy, then become an under gardener. Uh, and they'd either stay in the gardening business, and there were plenty of jobs in that trade, or they'd change, uh, change trades and, and go and do something else. But William seems to have, have stuck with it, at least for the time being. And he was still working as a gardener uh, when war broke out. Um, he was one of the first of our local men uh, to sign up. Uh, he enlisted um, at Westminster and he chose to join the City of London Regiment, the Royal Fusiliers. Our men, in the early days at least, tended to be either East Surrey, West Surrey um, or the Royal Fusiliers. And the Fusiliers were a very, very popular choice. They recruited at Epsom, uh, they recruited at Sutton um, as well. So he might have gone to, say, the Epsom a recruitment office to get particulars and then been sent to Westminster afterwards um, to complete his attestation and have his medical etc. Um, he was posted to a newly formed battalion uh, 
um, of the Royal Fusiliers, the 13th Service Battalion, um, a few weeks later. So all of these men had joined effectively almost as reservists for a while because they didn't have enough room for all these volunteers. So they had to create all these new um, battalions and those were generally established at the end of August and into September. Um, of that year, the service battalions, because they were for men who were just serving for um, the, the length of the war. 13th Battalion was formed in Hounslow. Uh, they very often kept their local affiliation, although this particular regiment uh, battalion didn't keep the word Hounslow in its title. Many of the other ones that were formed at that time did. Um, he trained on the home front for a number of months. Uh, all of Kitchener's volunteers um, thought they would be straight into the trenches, that they'd be issued with their uniforms and their rifles, and off they'd go, and the war would be over by Christmas. But of course, it wasn't at all like that. There was simply not enough equipment and, and kit for all these men. Um, they had to be trained. They couldn't be sent into battle as an undisciplined rabble, and that would take months. And the trouble is that almost all of the experienced NCOs and officers that should be doing that training were all by then in France or would be very shortly afterwards in France and Belgium. And so it was that these men were kept in camps, mostly um, a lot of them in the south of England. Um, they had very little to do at first. Um, they had very inexperienced officers, or they might have had uh, quite a few sort of retired majors and colonels who'd been on India service, who were too old to, for active service, would, would take it on, uh, take one of these service battalions on to train them up. Um, old Boer War NCOs would be brought back in to, uh, to train these men um, as well. Um, so they were training somewhere on the home front, not quite sure where, uh, and in December of 1914, um, William married um, Grace Finch, a girl from Norfolk, somewhere in the, in the Walsingham um, district. Again, intriguing, how did they meet? You know, did they know each other before the war, perhaps? They stayed on home front for several months after that. They probably hadn't even got uniforms by December. They were either wearing their civilian clothes or these blue suits that the, uh, the ministry, um, the war, ministry, war office had uh, issued as an emergency thing. It was quite the thing when you've got your khaki uniform for the, for the first time, very prestigious. They would have probably not had all the right buttons, and so the officers had to write to their friends or to their university chancellors if they were young to say, could you send me money for buttons for my men, for cap badges and, and all those sorts of things. No helmets in those days, of course, just, uh, just caps if you even had one of those. And they would have drilled with walking sticks and garden forks and whatever they had because they didn't have rifles still for months after that. So by the time these had done hardly any shooting, um, at all. And they would have just had a couple of rifles to share between all of them to learn how to maintain them. So it probably was that William, although he'd been training for months, wasn't particularly uh, an accomplished soldier as any of the men were uh, when he went out to France in July of 1915. Luckily for the 13th Battalion, they went to quite a cushy place on the River Somme. Uh, we think of it as a, you know, the, the hell of the battlefield there. Um, but for a long time, that was very, very quiet. The French and the Germans had, been, uh, had instituted a sort of unofficial truce. Um, the British ruined that when they turned up because we had very clear instructions that we were to always be aggressive in order to stop our men getting slack and getting comfortable. The downside of that was, of course, that the Germans got very, very irritated by all of these attacks. And just like you know, an oyster gets irritated by a piece of grit and forms a pearl around it, the Germans formed these defences. Um, these very significant defences because we kept trying to raid, um, raid into their trenches. So they were there in a very quiet sector um, until the following year, 1916, when um, the French and the Germans launched a joint offensive in order to break through the, um, the German defences on the Somme, uh, to punch a hole so that the cavalry could go through uh, and return the war uh, to a war of movement. Uh, as we all know, that didn't go according to plan. The first day of the battle, the British Army had nearly 60,000 casualties, uh, the bloodiest day um, in its history. Now, William and his battalion, they were some way north of that. They were just on the very fringes. There was a diversionary attack that day at the village of Gomcourt, and they were just even a little bit further um, away from that. Um, they encountered troops who'd fought, and they said that they looked like they hadn't had a particularly good time, and they hadn't. They, that attack was an absolute disaster, with very high casualty rates. Um, amongst the units that William and his uh, companions would have seen coming past them. They, uh, although they were north of the battlefield, the Somme was just this great mincing machine that was pulling in men um, from everywhere, really. And so it wasn't long for, the, for those men from 3rd Army from the north got transferred to 4th Army who were fighting on the Somme battlefield throughout the summer. Uh, and so it was that about a week or so after the battle began, 
Um, William and his companions took part um, in the third attempt to take the village of Oviers, which um, was a fortified village incorporated into the German front line. Uh, it was a place where uh, Banstis Cuthbert Buckle lost his life on the 3rd of July, and Tom Gurney from Dyson Road would lose his life on the 7th of July, the same day that William and his companions um, attacked the village. He fought in the summer uh, at the place where Willie Lazell uh, received what turned out to be a fatal wound, and in November he fought on the Battle of the Ancre where George Bryan picked up his fatal wounds. So we keep seeing him on battlefields that we've come across many times before, uh, meeting many of um, our Banstead and Burheath men who've lost their lives. Uh, in the spring of 1917, uh, the British Army fought at Arras. The Germans had retreated to the Hindenburg Line um, after the Battle of the Somme had weakened their positions, not broken their line, but damaged it enough that they had to pull back. The French were going to launch this giant offensive in the Champagne region, uh, and the British attacked the Hindenburg Line at Arras as a, as a, as a, a diversion for that. Um, he went onto the battlefield on the first day of the Battle of Arras, um, Easter Monday. It was very cold. It was a historically cold um, April. There had been snow on the ground just a couple of days um, beforehand. Um, he went onto the battlefield the same day uh, that three men from Banstead lost their lives fighting in that battle. Um, he was slightly later in the day uh, than those other men. They were mostly with the first wave. He and his battalion were with the second wave. Their job was to um, advance through the German second line, which by that point should have been captured, uh, and take a high village called Monchy le Preux, uh, which stood on a ridge in the middle of the battlefield. Um, on either side of it was, was a river. So it was about, I don't know, 3,000 yard wide uh, plateau, and then a hill on top of which was perched this village. Uh, and it was their job to take that village, and that would then clear the way for the cavalry to advance through, uh, continue all the way down that spur and up to the high ground beyond, and fingers crossed, we might restore the war of movement again. But as so often happened, uh, we never got to deploy uh, those cavalry. Or we tried to, anyway. They were coming up behind William's men. Uh, William and uh, his battalion reached that second line of German defences which should have been taken. They found it hadn't been taken. And so they had to punch their way through it. Um, they tried, they suffered um, heavy casualties. Um, once they were through it, they had to advance to um, that village. There were many machine gun nests um, outside it. The ground was quite open. Uh, and once they'd sort of crested the rise that they were advancing up um, over uh, Orange Hill, they met with fire from these uh, machine guns that were situated on the edges of, of uh, enclosures and earthworks um, in the fields before they reached the village. They had to stop, they couldn't get any further on. And they decided that what they'd do is they'd wait for dark and they'd send out patrols to stalk these uh, machine guns. But though that decision was countermanded, orders uh, were received that they had to try, it was now or never. Uh, and so they left their trenches once more and once more were cut down by the machine guns as they advanced. There was no getting any closer. They decided to dig in for that night. They'd only barely finished digging in at about 4 a.m. the following morning when they were ordered forward again uh, to take the village. Two brigades, the 111th and the 112th, advanced um, towards, uh, into the village. They fought their way um, in. They were still just about fighting for the village um, when the cavalry uh, finally arrived. Uh, amongst them, Banstead's George Titchener um, of Courthouse and my great-great-uncle. Um, they swept around to the north of the village on the left-hand side uh, and then met with machine gun fire from the river on their left and so they had to wheel into the centre of the village um, itself. Uh, it was a very confined space in the village square. Um, the shells falling uh, created what they called a charnel house of, of horses and men. The cavalry men dismounted, they found whatever safety they could for their horses which wasn't much and they joined with the infantry that were there, um, hiding by that point in the cellars of the town. And they improvised the defensive line. Uh, and they managed to, to consolidate and hold um, that village. But there would be no breakthrough that day, and there would be no breakthrough uh, until 1918 um, at Arras. After that, William and his um, battalion um, took part in, attack, uh, in an attack on the northern side of the river, uh, a place called Greenland Hill. I'm always amazed when I go and look at these places on, on the internet that they are so nondescript and they all look pancake flat and yet you look at a map and there's a five meter rise there or a 10 meter rise there, which is such a significant objective that hundreds of people lost their lives taking and now it's just 
pancake flat open field with a, an old supermarket next to it or something like that. It's very, even when you can see, even when you know what was there, it's still very hard to visualize um, these places, I find. They took part in that attack that day and after that were withdrawn uh, from the battlefield. The Arras attack eventually petered out. We turned our attentions north. Um, Douglas Haig wanted to launch an offensive at Ypres where he believed that he would be able to break the German line in 1917. We were going to land troops on the Belgian coast. Uh, we punched through at Ypres and these uh, troops landing on the coast in an amphibious landing would then uh, roll down the German line from the north as we were trying to break through it um, from the west. Before that could happen, we had to blow the Germans off the Messines Ridge, which was just south of Ypres, and it had observation over the whole of the Ypres salient, so they'd be able to see our troops building up there and fire their artillery pieces at us. Uh, and so we blew 500 tonnes of high explosive under the Messines Ridge in early June, um, and uh, it was a stunning success. Um, the British infantry advanced, um, captured their objectives. Slightly south of that, um, just after that attack happened, Williams' battalion, the 13th Royal Fusiliers, arrived and they were holding lines in that area. And no doubt they would have got sucked into the fighting uh, at Messines, um, uh, sorry, at Passchendaele uh, a little while later. Um, however, William didn't go through that. He was in the trenches at Messines when he was wounded, and we don't know how. There were five men uh, wounded in, in that particular tour of the trenches. And he was evacuated back home. He got, they got a blighty one. So there was a wound that wasn't serious enough that it meant he couldn't be moved too far, so he could be evacuated to England, but it was serious enough that it was probably going to be a long-term injury. It couldn't, be, it couldn't be sorted out in a fortnight or so, so he had to come home. And he remained on the home front uh, for months. We don't know where he was. He might have been in hospital all that time. Uh, he, might have, uh, he would have been able to be visited by his family. He may have been able even to have, to have come home uh, on leave um, at times. We simply don't know, unfortunately. After the success, the qualified success at Passchendaele, uh, we'd achieved our most, some of our objectives, um, but at a very, very costly price. Um, we were played out, effectively. We didn't have the men to go any further. Winter had arrived. Um, nothing more was to be done, and so we settled down on the Passchendaele Ridge um, to hold that. We were thinking now that we would have to wait to the following year, or Douglas Haig would have liked to have resumed it in the following year, I should say. Uh, Prime Minister Lloyd George uh, had had enough. He had, uh, he had other ideas and men were sent elsewhere. Um, so Hay had started to plan for a 1919 uh, war-winning offensive um, in Flanders. The Germans decided that they were going to win the war in 1918 instead, which rather put paid uh, to that plan. Uh, and in March of 1918, um, they attacked on the Somme front. Um, they attacked Fifth Army, who were resting from Passchendaele, who were very weak, who were holding a very long stretch of line. Uh, so very thinly stretched, and the Germans, uh, the Germans uh, broke through on the, on the morning of the 21st of March 1918. They were using new infantry tactics. They were seeking out the weak spots, not hammering away at the centres of resistance. They were just bypassing them. They'd go round them. The leading troops, very highly trained, very lightly equipped, uh, would just had, have instructions to get as far as they possibly could. They had no limiting objectives set. And then behind them were bodies of troops who would come up um, and would surround these centres of resistance and force the British holding them um, to surrender. It was an extremely effective tactic. Um, we retreated 30 or 40 miles um, in a fortnight. We weren't broken, it wasn't a rout, it was a fighting retreat. There was a semblance of order, but it was pretty desperate at times. We eventually stopped them outside Amiens, uh, and it was just after we'd stopped them that William had finished recu recuperating and he returned to France, uh, and he rejoined his uh, battalion probably on the 29th, um, of March, and um, they were just north of the old Somme battlefield, quite a, uh, a familiar place for him where he'd been um, in 1915-1916. Uh, it was very unsettled when he arrived, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of raiding, but the lines stayed pretty much put for the next few months. The Germans um, kept trying, they attacked, they'd attacked in March, now they attacked in Flanders um, in April, then they went south and attacked in May. Then they tried to join up the territory. They, they'd won this great big salient here in March, this great big other salient here in May, and they tried to then fill in the gap in June. Uh, now that was the least successful of, of defense, their offenses, um, offensives to date. 
um, they were getting worn out. They were losing an awful lot. They were gaining territory, but losing an awful lot of men. Uh, they were running out of supplies. Their supply lines were now miles and miles long. They ran across the churned up ground of the old Somme battlefield, the zone of devastation the Germans had created behind it. So it's a, a real logistical challenge to get their supplies to their men. And their men were hungry, they were thirsty, they were tired, they were uncomfortable because they weren't in long established positions with deep dugouts. They were in makeshift areas, you know, sleeping under canvas and all these sorts of things rather than, uh, rather than in proper shelter. And so it was that the Germans, although they appeared on paper to perhaps be winning the war, they were losing, they were losing the war by now. Um, in July, um, they attacked again, again in the south, near Rheim. Um, and when they had advanced about a dozen miles on the first day, and it looked like it was about to be business as usual in terms of the German territorial success, uh, Marshal Foch, um, who was in, by then in command of all the Allied forces, decided that that was the moment, this was the moment that he judged the Germans to be overextended and to be at their weakest. And he poured in all these reserves that he'd held back all through March, April, May and June. He'd been content to let the Germans have the land because he knew that it wasn't getting them anywhere really. And so it was now that he hit back with these forces, Americans, Italians, British and French. And we rolled the Germans back to the starting point of their, um, of their offense, offensive. Now that started on the 8th of August um, at Amiens, a surprise attack, lots of tanks, lots of planes, um, using new infantry tactics, um, new combined arms tactics that the army were using. They finally put together all the lessons they'd so painfully learned in 1916, 1917 into a successful formula. They managed to clear the Germans away from this vital railway hub and that paved the way for the offensive proper to begin on 21st of August. Um, we crossed the River Ancre in the northern half of the Somme battlefield. We captured the city of um, Albert and just to the north of that, were William Farley and the 13th Royal Fusiliers. They waited for their opportunity. They had patrols out to see, are the Germans retiring because of the fighting that's happening uh, on their right? And when they, when they found the Germans to be weak, they would advance and they'd steal the Germans' trenches, kick out the few that were still remaining there. And then they'd repeat this process over the next few days, um, advancing small amounts, um, uh, small amounts as and when the opportunity was given to them. As most of the British were doing up and down um, the line at that time. They were gradually gathering momentum, which would become uh, unstoppable. Uh, towards the end um, of August, or a few days later, sorry, it was their time to go into battle in a major attack. Um, now their job was to attack a line of defences that, um, that curved down towards uh, Bapome. So if they were where you're sitting here, um, there were a chain of villages diagonally stretched um, over that way. And they were all linked by these um, German defences. All these villages were fortified. Every house had a machine gun post in it, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, very well protected by wire. The poem was over there where the pillar is. Uh, and their job was to attack um, a village, which was the one just before uh, they got to the poem. They went over the top in the morning. Um, and as they approached this village, they came up stacks, great big piles of rubble from uh, from the building, uh, the brick-making trade, um, which was a, a nest of Germans. Um, the uh, Williams Battalion sent small groups of men um, all the way around it on either side until it was surrounded. Uh, all the while, their Lewis gunners constantly firing at it to keep the Germans' heads down. Uh, and once the Germans realised they, they were surrounded, uh, they gave up. The Germans were by now beginning to give up very easily. Their morale had gone. The Fusiliers carried on around the village. Uh, they crawled up a railway bank um, on the other side of the railway embankment was a deep cutting uh, with a railway line in it. But the Germans were lining the near slope of this, of this cutting. They were very, um, very well concealed, making very good use of uh, this natural cover. So as soon as the fusiliers crawled over the top, they met an immense volume of fire and they, had, they could not tell where it was coming from because the Germans were so um, well concealed. Eventually, more and more fusiliers arrived uh, and they lined the, the, the edge of this embankment and they just fired for all they were worth, not knowing where they were aiming, to just develop a great big volume of fire that they could then use to cover small parties who crawled over the top of this embankment and then could then fire along the, the, the far slope of it, uh, the slope of it where, on the other side where the Germans were, were lying. A Lewis gun team dashed right over the embankment, down, down the hill, across the railway line, up the far side of the embankment, turned around and started machine gunning the Germans from the back shooting at the, uh, the huts uh, that um, they've been staying in, uh, well, the machine gun teams were in uh, at the bottom of this railway cutting. Uh, 
Uh, this panicked the Germans. They started to, to retreat. Um, a platoon, um, a fusiliers, ran over the embankment and down the other side and charged the Germans. They dropped their rifles and surrendered. And took something like 400 prisoners in that railway cutting. German officers assisted the fusiliers. They went round the dugouts, showing them where the dugouts were and calling to their men to come out and surrender. An unstoppable momentum had built up. Um, about a week later, all five British armies were advancing. The Germans were falling back um, to the Hindenburg Line. We fought them as we went, uh, and we reached the Hindenburg Line in late September. Um, on 29th of September, we launched the first, of, um, the first attack of an offensive that would eventually stretch from the River Meuse all the way almost to the Belgian coast. Um, and a, a couple of days after that battle started, um, attacks started to go in in the centre at Cambrai and San Quentin, which was the area that William and his battalion um, were in. The first defences of the Hindenburg Line eventually fell a few days later. Um, the Germans realised at this point, or the German commander realised at this point, that the game was up. Um, he told the Kaiser that they should ask for an immediate uh, armistice. The German Chancellor opened negotiations um, as soon as, uh, I think, on the 8th of October. Um, he opened those with the Americans, because he, not with the Allies as a whole. The Americans weren't officially an ally, they were just an associated power. And they had different uh, war aims. They actually, well, they actually had war aims. They had a, a plan of 14 points that they wanted to achieve, whereas everyone else was just fighting the war, and they didn't really know what winning looked like. But the Americans had a plan. And the Germans said, this plan isn't so bad. We can sign up to this. I mean, heaven knows what the British and the French would have offered them as surrender terms, probably nothing particularly generous. So they signed up to President Wilson's 14 points uh, and opened negotiations directly with them. And it was after that that, that Wilson then negotiated with the Allies to make them sign up to his um, plan as well. But while this was going on, the German army was still fighting. The Hindenburg Line had been breached on a 20-mile front um, at uh, San Quentin, but it was still almost intact at Cambrai. Um, just the first, line of the first two lines of defences had fallen. There was still a third line and more behind that. And it was the job of the 13th Royal Fusiliers to go in to clear uh, the rest of those defences on the 8th of October. Um, they, um, if you imagine you are on the near side of a ridge, um, and just over the other side of the ridge is the third line of German um, defences, uh, the Masnier line. Um, just over here, the high ground is this end. There's a, a canal down that end, so it all slopes down um, that way. Um, this line runs along the back of this, this ridge where it would be very difficult for our artillery to shoot directly at them. Uh, and incorporated um, into that line is a farm here. Beyond that's a valley about a thousand yards wide with a little farm in it. On the far side is another ridge with another line of defences and another farm uh, incorporated into it. Now, William's Battalion's job was not this first line of defences. Um, someone else would take care of that. Their job was to leapfrog that unit and go on and take this second line um, of defences over there. Unfortunately, the battalion that were advancing in front of them uh, had not cleared the fortified farm that was built into this first uh, line of defences, and so William's Battalion struggled um, to get past that. It took a, a lot of effort to clear up that particular situation. But they did, and they reached their assembly point for their, their own attack um, on time, although having suffered more casualties than they would have liked um, in order to get there. After that, they advanced down the valley and up the other side uh, towards this second line of German defences. One company were attacking this fortified farm. Uh, another company were to advance beyond that and take a sunken road which curved around uh, to their left to a wood, which were then incorporated into that second line of German defences. Uh, and while, the other, while they were doing that, the other two companies were to form a defensive flank between that farm and this farm, um, just up here, coming diagonally across the, uh, the valley. So it was that these two companies approached the farm and the road behind it. Um, they, the barrage was dropping in front of the farm. So although the Germans could not necessarily see the fusiliers advancing very easily, um, they would have caught glimpses and they would have known they were there. And so from about a range of 800 yards away, they were able to open fire with their uh, machine guns um, and hit these Royal Fusiliers, even though they might, have, might not have been able to see them perfectly. So this barrage that was falling in front of the farm was doing absolutely no good, except obscuring the situation for the men that were attacking the farm. Just to the left of the farm was a strong point, uh, and just to the right of, of all this was a copse that was also 
not being bombarded and full of machine guns and was able to fire on the fusiliers um, as they advanced. These chaps got as close as they could and when the barrage began to creep forward and um, uh, temporarily paused on the farm as it passed through, uh, they were able to rush forward uh, and capture um, the farm and began consolidating their position there. Um, on their left, the other company that were heading for the sunken road were advancing over the second spur when suddenly Germans started emerging from dugouts in which they'd been hiding behind them and started machine gunning the fusiliers uh, from behind. They were pinned down, they couldn't go any further uh, until a tank um, finally arrived um, later that day uh, and, and cleared them out of the way. And they, they went on to, to reach their, um, their objective, uh, although they suffered very heavy casualties in doing so. There was no rest. Uh, they were advancing again the following day. Um, they were advancing miles now every day. The Germans were not being routed, but they, it was getting pretty close um, to it. They were retreating hungry, tired, their boots worn out, uh, their clothing you know, ripped. They're running out of ammunition, they're running out of supplies, they're abandoning their machine guns and abandoning their artillery pieces um, as they go, hoping to just reach that next set of defences where they would be uh, safe for the time being. Anyway, and so the Fusiliers pursued them on the 9th, um, uh, the 9th of October uh, and uh, managed to reach their objectives that day with comparatively few casualties, the, the worst coming from two British tanks. Uh, unfortunately, who lost their sense of direction and didn't realise they were shooting at British troops instead of German ones, and it took an awful lot of effort. I mean, if you can imagine, they're just looking through a small slot and to achieve their objectives that day, and they were relieved. William was wounded um, on either the 8th or the 9th of October. Uh, he was evacuated for treatment, but he died of his wounds 100 years ago um, today. Um, he's buried in France, uh, quite close to that, the final battlefield that he fought on. He was 25 years old. Let us pray. Father of all, remember your promise, living and departed. On this day, we especially remember William Farley and ask that you would hold forever him and all who suffered during the First World War those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned. Those who mourned, and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember too, those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their own lives for their comrades, and those who in the aftermath of war work tirelessly for a more peaceful world. And as you remember them, remember us. O Lord, grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when people of every language, race and nation will be brought into the unity of Christ's kingdom. This we ask in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Would you please stand for the Kohim Epitaph? When you go home, tell them of us and say, that there tomorrow we gave our today. God grant to the living grace, the departed rest, the church, the queen, the commonwealth and all the world, peace and concord and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.